Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to the Thursday afternoon edition of PCA Live 3 at 3. We have two very special guests with us today. We have uh, brought back the, the old uh, famous RTDA uh, cigar store Indian that was out in our lobby. We brought him in for the interview today to join us because we got a really special guest with us, and that is none other than George Padrone. We are ecstatic to have George, who's taken some time out of his busy schedule to join us today to talk about some of the current issues that are going on, talk about the Padron family, the Padron line of cigars, and his outlook on the industry amidst all of this. So to bring up the honored guest of the hour, let's bring on George Padron. George, hello, and thank you for joining us. Hey, guys. Thank you for having me. It's nice to be here. How's everything going down there in Miami? Everything's going well. We're working. The family's working. You know, we've, uh, you know, operating as safely as possible, and we've been you know, pushing along and trying to keep things moving, keep product on the shelves for the retailers and, uh, you know, just working like we always have. That's great. Uh, so I got Josh Aberski is, is here with me. And uh, I just would like to first comment. That's uh, I love the space. When we first brought up here, I said it almost looks like it's a museum dedicated to the history of the Padron family and the cigars. Is that just kind of a basic office area? Or where is that that you are right now? Well, this is actually the reception of our of our warehouse. You know, our office is here in Miami, and all of the pictures that you see behind me are, you know, historical pictures of our family, my father, you know, my grandfather, my uncle, uh, you know, pictures of myself as a as a young, you know, you know, five year old running around the factory, my brother. I mean, you know, it's a it's just mostly family pictures. You know, that's kind of like the feel that we have here. And then in the back, you have some pictures of some, you know, friends that have sent us pictures of them smoking and famous people. That, have you know, we've had over the years and then in the back you, you don't see it from here but there's the little hammer we have the original hammer back there also on display so, oh wow that's awesome fantastic so a, lot of, a lot of history a lot of history in this in this area of our, of our facility yeah. That's awesome. We really appreciate you joining us. We we have to at least tell everyone that's viewing this we are both enjoying padron cigars for this special occasion um, but, you know, one of the questions that I have, George, and, um, you know, how have you been able to expand a global brand and sustain that brand over the years, you know, through all of the different happenings? Obviously, we're in a unique situation with coronavirus right now, but, you know, it's a, a, a time-honored brand um, that has sustained its reputation throughout and has a you know a quality portfolio known for consistency. You know, well, Josh, I mean that that question is a loaded question. I mean, oh, absolutely. Hard, you know, to to achieve success over a long period of time takes a lot of dedication. You know, consistency in, in how you handle your affairs, having great employees. Uh, you know, my father was um, a very humble man. I don't know if you guys ever got a chance to meet him. But, you know, he was someone that started with nothing, and he never forgot where he came from. Um, you know, he realized early on the importance of, of establishing a solid foundation in the business, um, you know, both financially as well as with the people that he surrounded himself with. And uh, I think that, you know, that mentality that he had of, number one, having a sound financial model, uh, number two, not overextending himself, um, Number three, focusing, I should put it, should have put this as number one, which is focusing only on quality and that and only that. And then, of course, the last one is your employees. I mean, quality and great employees. Those are the two things that you have to have as a, you know, as a mindset in your business. And then, of course, everything else falls in place. And, you know, I was fortunate, uh, you know, to, to come along at a time when, you know, my, the company was already almost 30 years old and, uh, you know, my dad had gotten us to a certain level and you know i was i came in at the right time my brother was here working as well my sister you know we, we've always been working here and uh you know we were able to take it to another level we started attending the trade shows we started selling cigars you know nationally whereas before we were only in miami so i mean there's a there's a lot of factors that have allowed us to get to where we are and you know as far as establishing a global brand i mean the only way to do that is with time you know um we're of the mentality that, you know, it's better to go slowly, but take steady steps. And, uh, you know, our focus has never been on volume of product produced, but rather on the quality of the product produced. And uh, that's really kind of what has uh, directed our thinking 
um, in every decision that we make is, is based on that. How will that affect our image? How will that affect our quality? How will that affect our employees? How will that affect the long-term uh, view of this and pro uh, opportunities that we may have as a company? Yeah. So the, one of the things, uh, common thread that's we talked about right there, number one, obviously learning from your father, talk about pictures of you back there as a five-year-old. You've grown up in this business. Yeah, you learn, as you said, from your father, a master at this. Uh, talk a little bit about, if you don't mind, what, what growing up in the business has meant to you and what you really learned. I mean, you talked about kind of some of the stuff that your father said, look, the quality. But what are some of maybe the intangibles that people don't often think about when, when building a global brand like yours? That you did learn from your father while growing up in this business and, and around him and and how he established it and, and carried it forward you know scott it's funny because you know uh growing up you know maturity comes in stages and sometimes as a young you know being younger people don't understand the true value of certain things um you know i was again very fortunate to have a father that always led by example um, I remember as a young, as a young boy, my father waking up at 6 a.m., go coming to the office and not coming back till six, seven o'clock at night. He would be gone the entire day working, and you know he was just somebody that always was thinking about working and about how to, you know, focusing on certain things. He was very focused and disciplined. Uh, you know, for me, and obviously witnessing that as a, as a youngster was an important lesson. Not that I necessarily understood it at the time or valued it like I should have at the time, but but as you get older, like things start to trickle. Like I guess your filter starts to open up and you start to realize, okay, shit, now I understand why that happened and now I understand why that happened. So like things uh, over time that you start to realize things that, that they've always been there, but maybe you didn't appreciate them at one point and now. And then as you get older, you start to say, wow, you know, Thank God that I had that opportunity, or thank God that I, that I had that lesson. And I think, you know, that falls, you know, for all of everyone in my family. You know, my, my dad was never uh, a person that uh, really kind of forced things on me. He kind of, uh, he was a very tough guy. Um, you know, he demanded respect, uh, but he sort of also, uh, you had to earn his respect. He never gave anything to you. You had to earn it. And that goes for me, that goes for my brother, that goes for anyone in, in our company. And I can assure you that he was a lot harder on us than he was on other on other employees that were not direct family members. But I think that at the end of the day, that's kind of how it has to be in a family business. You have to have you know that tough love with people so they appreciate and no one feels entitled to anything. Yeah. Well, and that for you as well, I think that probably is important because that way you truly feel like you earned it and that it wasn't handy to you. And that way it means more to you, right? And it just kind of reminds me of the old adage, the older you get, the smarter your parents become. Absolutely, there's no question about it. You know, and I have a, I have a 22 year old, 21 year old son. I have nephews that are in their 20s as well. I have older nephews. I have a lot of family members that are working with me now that are the next generation. And you know, that's sort of like the message that I always give to them. I'm, I'm a hard ass on them, but I tell them you don't have to be that way because you know, if we, we want this to continue for your generation like it like it has up until now you guys need to step up to the plate and understand what it takes to make this the company that it is you know we didn't get to where we are now by by being lazy by not focusing on the little things you know those little things those little details are the ones that make the big difference at the end and that's sort of like something that you can't teach in college you can't teach in yeah. you know it's just something that you have to live in. Because at the end of the day, it ought to mean more to you that it's your family's name on that brand, right? And if it's given to you, I think that that kind of diminishes that. 100%. I mean, that's what I, I mean. I'm arguing and I'm stressing to them, like when they shrink wrap boxes, if the boxes are, the shrink wrap is broken, change the shrink wrap. We, we have the number one, you know, we have one of the best cigars in the world and we're going to put it out with a box that's a broken. I mean, shit, some things could slip through the cracks, but I'm saying, you know, it's those little things that if you're focusing on all the little things, that's what allows you to be successful. And that's what you we try to instill in them. Don't take anything for granted. You know, you know take advantage of the opportunities in that. Absolutely. One of my favorite things about doing this series, you know, the Facebook Lives with different, you know, personalities in the industry is the stories and symbols that we hear about. And, you know, 
I think one of the iconic symbols is the hammer that you referenced in, in the introduction. Uh, for folks that are, are new, we, you know, we have a lot of folks on Capitol Hill that are, are tuning into this. Um, can you tell us that story uh, about the hammer and the symbol that it means for your company? Well, I mean, the, the hammer, you know, as, as uh, I'll say, I mean, some people may not know our history, you know, but my father was a Cuban immigrant. Uh, who came in the early 60s and uh, many of the, all of, you know, the Cuban immigrants at the time were very fortunate that the U.S. government set up an assistance program for all of the refugees coming in and um, that assistance program gave them certain things that they were entitled to, uh, you know, basic necessities, item, basic necessity items as well as some cash, you know, that they would receive on a monthly basis. Um, you know, my father, who was probably about 37, 38 years old at the time, was uh, signed up for the program and for a few months he was coming in to collect you know the handout or you know whatever they were giving at the time and you know he had a problem with that and that he you know looked at himself as someone that was you know young able to work um, you know I don't know he had a lot of pride obviously you know so he he kind of didn't feel right taking that money so he he had gotten to know the director of the, of the, whatever, the, you know, the organization that was giving the money out, and he befriended him. And it got to a point where he met with him. He said, "Listen, I, I please take me off of this list. I don't. I'm not coming back to get this check." And then the gentleman who had already gotten to know my dad and kind of knew who I was, he knew that my dad liked carpentry, so he gives my father a small hammer that uh, was a finished carpentry hammer. And uh, my dad took it, and, and at the time, my dad was working, you know, doing all sorts of odd jobs. He was doing lawn work, uh, and then at night, he was moonlighting as a carpenter. So what he would do is basically in the 60s, and, you know, you guys are fairly young. You may not remember this, or you may not even, may not even been alive at the time, honestly. But, you know, before drywall, all this, the plywood paneling, the decorative plywood paneling was very popular in homes and in businesses. And uh, that's what my dad would do. He would do uh, partitions and, and cover them with plywood. And that's, and that's how he used that hammer. And with the money he earned doing those moonlighting jobs is the money that he used to start for the own cigars, which was, you know, $600. So that's, let's, oh, sorry, go ahead. The hammer for us is a symbol of a lot of things. Uh, but obviously the perseverance that he had, the, you know, the respect for his name, you know, the, the humility that he always displayed, you know, hard work. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, things that we learned from that um, anecdote that, you know, at the time may seem symbolic, but they really mean a lot, you know, and it takes a lot, you know, for someone who has nothing to reject a hand, you know, to reject the money because he, just based on principle, he didn't agree with it. So I think that that's kind of like, you know, that's what I explain to my kids. I tell them, listen, it's not, you know, one thing is to turn down money if you don't need it. Another thing is to turn it down when you do need it and because, because you don't feel it's the right thing to do. And that's, you know, from a, from a moral or ethical or so physical, and I don't know, mental standpoint, you know, that's, and that's something that I, you know, I've always admired in, in thinking about that story, you know, that kind of puts it into context, you know, as to what, it, what that represents. Yeah, and I think that that truly exemplifies the, the character of your father. And it reminded me, uh, Pete Johnson just uh, said hi to everybody uh, on the, the Facebook chat line there. And it reminded me of the story that's in the hand roll documentary. So for anybody that's out there, absolutely go and buy that documentary, watch it, share it as far and wide as possible because it tells a beautiful story about the history of this industry. Um, but in that, you know, it, it goes through a little bit more about how respected your father was and negotiating the release of um, and with uh, sitting down with Fidel actually and helping to get political prisoners released and I mean your father uh, your story right there about I need money but I'm going to turn it down because I'm able to go do this uh, for me that just sort of exemplifies everything that that he stood for from what I've heard and I unfortunately never had a chance to meet him but from everything not just from you but from what I've heard from other people about your father that exemplifies that and I think one of the main reasons why he was the type of person that was going to be at that table with Castro 
to negotiate the release of those political prisoners and why he was so respected. Because I think I carried through, and that's the integrity of his character. Well, I mean, my dad always told me that, you know, that people have to have three traits that are fundamental. Number one, you have to have respect for your family name. And you have to be appreciative of those that help you when you need it most. And my dad had plenty of people who helped him when he needed it. And he never forgot those people. And mm-hmm. even if he died, he still was grateful. And, and in many different ways, he showed how grateful he was to those people. Um, and the last thing he said, he always said, you have to be humble. You have to show humility. You know, that was one of my dad's biggest traits. You know, he was one of the most simple people, a complicated person from a mental you know, standpoint. He was a very intelligent guy, uh, very funny. Sometimes if people didn't know him, you may have thought that he was a very serious guy, but he really wasn't. I mean, he was a tremendous jokester. <laughs> but at the same time, serious. You know, he knew he was a great storyteller. He was a great joke teller, much better than I am. I'm a terrible joke teller and storyteller. But, I mean, he had a lot of traits that, I mean, my dad could sit down and talk to the president of Cuba or, you know, the United States, and he could also sit down and talk to a farmer. And he would be able to, to adapt to whatever situation he was presented with. And I think that that, you know, that really gave him a, a unique perspective on things you know he had that perspective i guess from the life is from living and the way he did and all the things that he went through like many of the cuban immigrants that came during those days that you know went from living in cuba to coming here and having to start everything again you know new uh you know like a foreign country they don't know the language they don't have money I and mean, you know it takes a lot of things to it makes you really tough it makes you like a tough person that uh, isn't really bothered by the small things and really is focused on the important things. And I think like my dad, in this situation that we're facing now, probably would have been a tremendous leader. You know, yeah. it was someone that he, he knew how to get to the essence of problems and not so much focus on all the ancillary stuff that some people tend to focus on when you're not really focusing on the true problem at hand. And of course, a lot of us that are in our businesses now, we're we're facing a lot of challenges. Uh, Obviously, in the cigar industry, we have tremendous challenges that we're facing, you know, both at retail level, at manufacturing, at distribution. I mean, everyone is facing these problems, as well as in many other industries. You know, employees, you know, it's it's a complicated situation right now, obviously. Something that we're kind of in uncharted waters. I mean, really no one could ever have imagined that we would be in this type of situation. Yeah. Yet, you know, some companies and some people figure out a way to keep their focus and focus on the positives and make things work, get through it, live to fight another day and keep things rolling. And that's kind of, you know, how it has to be. You know, you can't bury your hand in the sand and pretend like, you know, the world is ending. No, you got to keep pushing. And that's, and that's, and that's what I told my family when this thing started. I go, now is when the, the, now is when People's characters are measured during difficult times. That's when we know what we got. Are you going to come to work and work extra? Are you going to do extra? Because you have to do it because we can't bring in employees to do it. We got to do it. And that's that's the key. I know that my dad would have done that. He would have been one of those guys that would have been here from 5 a.m. to 10 a.m. to do whatever he could. And that's kind of the mentality that all... All of us in small businesses and in family businesses have to have, right? If, if, if you can't, you got to get it done somehow. Yeah, it's amazing looking at the the different stories of resiliency and, and people really coming together to get through this this difficult time. Um, you know, another time when people truly enjoy Padron cigars is obviously a time of celebration. Um, My guest last week, um, author Nick Hammond of uh, Around the World in 80 Cigars, talked about punctuation marks uh, in his life as ways to culminate special and important events. What are some milestones or punctuation marks in the Padron Cigar Company, and what are you personally most proud of? Sure. I mean, I got so many things I'm proud of. (laughs) I mean, not not because of me, but because we've been able to accomplish a lot as a family. You know, I'm I'm proud that my dad was able to to 
I mean, my, my dad really worked his ass off for many years. And maybe, I don't know, he may not have gotten the, the recognition that he may have deserved. And he did get that. And he was able to see it. He was able to witness it. He was able to, to establish tremendous relationships with many manufacturers that are great friends. I mean, listen, this is a beautiful industry. And uh, I mean, there's a lot of things to be proud of in what's happened both for Padron as well as for this industry. I mean, this industry has really developed. It's, you know, it's grown into a, a, a mostly, I mean, a family type feel you know, in, in terms of everyone that we encounter. Uh, you know, we have great relationships with everybody. You know, we've been able to establish a brand that people respect and that people are loyal to. That's probably like, you know, I think, you know, if you, if you ask me, like, what is it that makes us happy? Well, the one thing that I'm most proud of is that we have a brand that people think and, and, and acknowledge that it is a consistent brand, that it's, it's quality driven, uh, and that people trust us. I mean, as, as, a, as, a, as a person who has a brand that, uh, that we've developed from, from day one, what is it that you look for in, uh, when you're starting a company, right? You want to you wanna establish a loyal customer. You, know, you want to establish people and customers that trust you, that they know you're not going to mess around with what you're doing. You know, that's kind of what it is, right? People, when they know when they pick up a Padron cigar, they expect a certain level of quality. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's kind of a very rewarding thing when people tell you that, that they, they feel that the product is a great product and that they, they that if they only had one cigar to smoke, they would smoke a Padron. I mean, that's, what else? I mean, how, you know how good that makes you feel? Right. You know, that's kind of what I tell everyone. You know, that's why quality wins out at the end because, you know, we have cigars at every price point. I mean, you don't have to spend, you know, $30 to smoke a great Padron. You can spend $6 to smoke a great Padron. Now, you know, obviously we have at every price point, and that's the key. You're like, you don't you have that flexibility. The consumer has that flexibility. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's, uh, for me, uh, for years, having been a cigar smoker, um, it, oftentimes, you know, so what do you think of when you think of this cigar? What do you think of when you think of this cigar? And I think consistently, and I use that word uh, kind of pun intended, is that whenever you ask about Padron cigars, whether it's to the retailers or consumers, they always talk about consistency. One of the, if not the most consistent brand that's out there in terms of every time you light it up, you know what you're going to get. Um, and, and to your point right there, it's, it's that attention to detail and quality that, that, that comes through. Um, to kind of follow up on that, I'm, I'm always so interested in this because as you just talked about, right, you feel good about it. Um, and I think with cigars, I liken it to, you know, I went to culinary school and I would prepare a nice meal for folks and when they really enjoyed that, that made me feel really good because you're putting so much of yourself into trying to create something for people to enjoy. And I just, for me, it's so much, it's an art form and it's something that I could never do because I don't have the skill set to do it. And so I'm constantly sort of amazed by what all of you are able to do. Um, so I'm really curious about your approach because there's this balance of, of consistency, but at the same time, that art craft, right? And just sort of your approach to when you're, you're blending the cigars and what you want to put out and, and sort of that artistic endeavor that you take into creating the cigars that are so consistently good and high quality and delicious. Well, be before I answer that question, I want to go back to your question of one of the things I've been most proud of. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, totally skipped over. I forgot, I forgot to admit, I didn't, maybe it wasn't as clear with it, is that um, one of the things that made my father the proudest was the fact that he was able to establish a family business. And that when he died, his whole family was around him. And that when he was here in his, you know, in the last couple of years of his life that he would come into the office, he loved to see his family here. It didn't matter. Even if, if we had to be pushing them to work all the time, he didn't care. He, he just loved to see his family here. And I think, um, and he said it to me many, many times. He would say to me that our employees in Nicaragua are, this, that the Padron family is not just the Padron family. It's, we have an extended family just all of the employees that we have in Okinawa. And I think um, there's no way that Padron would be where it is today had it, would it not be for the, the, the great employees that we have in Nicaragua and the loyalty that they've shown to us over many years. We have employees in Nicaragua that have been with for 40, 
30, 30, 40, and there's a couple, there's one person who has been there since day one, since we started in Nicaragua. This year is the 50th anniversary of the founding of the company in Nicaragua. And one of our employees that is working there today and his wife were both original employees from 1970. That's Congratulations, that's a huge mile. Yeah. So like him and her, well, she came a little later, but he was there from day one. Uh, we have a handful of people that have been with us for over 40 years. So I think that that also says a lot about my father, the type of person that he was. And I think that that helped him, helped us get to where we are today. And I think that that dovetails into the question about the quality and all of these things that, that we talk about when we try to, you know, what we aspire to and what we make cigars, right? Um, you know, making cigars is a complicated thing. It's not, you know, there's a lot of attention to detail at many different levels, starting from, you know, seed selection, planting, you know, not cutting corners. I mean, you know, the expenditure on the farms, you know, you can, you can grow, we, we measure in manzanas, but just to give you an example, let's say some people may spend, you know, on an acre of land, $5,000, well, we spend double that. You know what I mean? Just to give you an example, in terms of numbers, right? Um, what does that mean? Well, you're spending a lot more money, but you're also getting a higher yield of tobacco, possibly, and you're, you're going through a lot of, you know, little details there that increase the cost of production, but they pay off at the end in terms of the quality of the tobacco. And again, those numbers are not they're fictitious, but I'm just using it as, a, as an example, right? Yeah. Um, so that's where it starts. And then, you know, you have all the process of, you know, the curing of the tobacco and then the production and all along that process, there are many, many different things that can be wrong. And, uh, you know, the key is, you know, to, to have a plan in place where you're not rushing the process, uh, you have good people to manage the process, and, uh, and you basically don't deviate from that. You know, you, you know what you're trying to get, and if, if, it's, if the tobacco's not ready, it's not ready, period. And it, and it waits until it is, and we wait until it is. So, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that, have, that happen in order to be able to make a consistent product, but the number one thing you have to have is great tobacco. You can't make great cigars if you don't have great tobacco. And then that's where, you know, in order to have a great tobacco, you need to do all of these other things to get you to that point. So, I mean, it's a, compli it's a complicated process, but again, the fact that we have these great people and that we've been doing it as long as we have, and we don't try to overextend ourselves and grow too rapidly, uh, that allows us to have a consistent production that, you know, that doesn't really change much from year to year, um, but, but yet the product stays consistent. So I want to shift over a little bit, George, to the industry at large. You know, you're one of the, the key stakeholders in the premium cigar industry. You know, looking at the outlook and the future for, for the rest of this year and into next year, you know, what are some of the biggest challenges that the industry is going to face? And how do we turn those challenges into opportunities where the industry can grow and thrive? Well, I mean, I think... You know, I look at, I look at this, I always look at this through quality. Uh, I think that the only way to ever come ahead, uh, come out ahead in these types of situations is to know that you're producing a quality product because that is going to trump everything else. But in addition to that, you obviously have to be very well organized in, in how, you, you know, how you handle your business affairs. You know, obviously production has to be very well controlled. You know, you have to... Yep. There's a lot of factors right now. I mean, obviously, we're going through a very difficult time. Um, you know, there's a lot of things happening in the industry that, that we don't know yet how things will end up, you know, six, seven months from now. You know? um, our approach is basically to, to try and deviate as little as possible from what we were doing before. So, obviously, we really haven't changed much in terms of, you know, how we're doing things uh, as a company. But we're, you know, we're, we're obviously taking the necessary precautions to ensure that there's safety in, in the workplace, and that we're not, you know, running any unnecessary, you know, any risks that, that shouldn't be taken or that should, we really shouldn't be taking any risks. Period. Um, 
you know, I think that it's hard to answer that question right now because we're still, there's still a lot of unknowns. Um, you know, obviously there's a lot of changes uh, in, the, in the retail market. We don't know how, how some of these, uh, you know, all the, the issues that are dealing with the closings of stores and the, the, the whole shutdowns and how that's going to affect retail, how it will affect consumers coming into retail. Um, you know, I think that for the most part, the, the retailers that, that I know and that I've talked to are all taking, you know, the necessary precautions to do things the right way. And I think that the consumers um, have shown, in many cases, the loyalty that they have to these retailers and to the cigar industry in general. And, you know, and I think overall, forget about the cigar industry, I think even myself as a consumer, I've wanted to give business to my local businesses, you know. Uh, obviously, there are some things that we just can't uh, uh, do right now because of closings or because of these quarantines and all this. But whenever possible, I try to give business back to the local businesses. And I think that that's something that, as Americans, that's kind of the American way, right? I think that whenever there's been hardships, people always find a way to come back to home base and say, okay, what, what do we need to do here to, to make this a better situation? Well, let's support. Let's support the people that are around us and support the people that, that are with, you know, that are, that are interacting with on a regular basis. So, and I think, again, I think, there, like I said before, there's always an opportunity. Out of everything negative, something positive comes out, in my opinion. Um, and the way that we've tried to handle this is, number one, to show our loyalty to our many retailers that have been customers of ours for many, many years. We've tried to keep a steady supply of product for them, um, you know, so that they can do whatever they can with the business that they have available to them. Um, we've obviously, we've obviously not even, I mean, as far as quality is concerned, we haven't made any changes to any of our production. Uh, you know, as far as how the cigars are produced. So, I mean, I think time will tell. I mean, time will tell how how this affects. And the number one thing I said to all of our employees in Nicaragua is that the you know, of course, safety is the number one issue. But beyond that, we cannot sacrifice quality. And if that means that we have to make less cigars because of whatever we're doing, that means that that's what we're doing. And I'm not afraid to, 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 to have that situation happen to me um, as far as having less cigars to sell. Uh, I'd rather maintain the quality and maintain a safety, a safe working environment. I've been, you know, really impressed with some of the ingenuity and adaptive ways that both manufacturers and retailers have responded through, you know, different virtual events um, and, you know, trying to get in new people and new consumers of premium cigars, you know, while people are at home, um, you know, giving it a try. And, and I think that that has been uh, hopeful. You know, we did the the segment uh, was still led better in Chicago and some of the things that they're doing. And, you know, people are working harder, but, you know, again, they're still delivering that quality service as, as you speak. And I think it's been, you know, good to see it, it taking place with all three parts of the important components of the industry being manufacturers, retailers, and consumers. And, you know, when all this subsides, it'll take all three of those components working in concert together. And, you know, that also translates into some of the, uh, you know, fights that we have at the legislative and regulatory level. You know, we, our strength is in numbers and, you know, getting all the folks together and, and rowing in one direction, so to speak, is, is important. Absolutely. I mean, I think during these times, you can leave no stone unturned. You, know, yeah. you have to, you have to think outside the box. Uh, you have to do whatever needs to be done. And like I said earlier, in tough times are the true measure of tough people, right? And now is when you know what you got. And that's uh, you know if that means that you got to work twice as hard. And that's what you got to do. Just to, you know you got to make sure that that's that's what's that's what's at the top of mind. And I think you know from what I've seen. You know, I know that people are really thinking outside the box. And I know that people are trying to do the best that they can, given the circumstances that they're facing. Um, you know, and that's really what this is all about, right? Is how to, how do we get, you know, get through this? You know, this will end, this will pass. And hopefully, you know, when this passes, this is going to be a much stronger industry. 
and uh, I think that there'll be a, a newfound appreciation for our products because people, I think, have realized that cigars are, you know, a product that's meant to be enjoyed. It's not a product that's mass consumed, but you know, it's nice to be able to sit back and relax and enjoy a cigar. Um, and you know, maybe some people haven't had as much of an opportunity to do that in the past, and now, and now you have a little bit more time to do it, and, uh, and it helps people, you know, come calm down and and think things through a little bit better. I mean, I know. I remember my dad always used to tell me, he always used to be very proud of telling people that he never in his life took a sleeping pill. Because for him, if he couldn't sleep at night, he would just wake up. He didn't even try to fight it. He would just get out of bed, go downstairs to the sofa, and light up a cigar. And he'd smoke the cigar, he'd get all the stuff out of his brain, and then when he was done, he'd just go back up and fall back asleep. And that was it. <laughs> he used to be pretty great. He used to be really proud of that. You know what I'm saying? Like, I've never taken a sleep pill in my life. You know, he was like 90 years old. <laughs> and, yeah, I remember when I was in Nicaragua, I'd be sleeping and I could smell the cigar smoke at three in the morning. You know, I I don't know how far you're going to take that. I don't I don't assume that we're going to see a Padron Nyquil branded cigar anytime soon, though, right? <laughs> not, yet, not yet. Not yet. Yeah. So for anybody else that's out there, there you go. You got a brand called Nyquil or something along those lines that's ready for you. But it's funny you mention that because um, the, the majority of times when I do enjoy a cigar, I've actually – someone asked me a question recently if I'm smoking more or less, and I'm actually smoking more. But I've discovered you know, the, the beauty of, of a breakfast cigar, right? Going out with a coffee in the morning and having a cigar outside of my back patio is – hey, that's a great way to start the day and start it in the right frame of mind. But I've always enjoyed after dinner going outside and having a cigar to end the night. And to your point – I could honestly say I generally have a much better time of winding down and going to sleep after I've been able to enjoy a cigar at the end of the day. There's no question about it. Yeah, of course. I mean, it just helps you relax. I mean, that's the bottom yeah. line. My, my uh, routine as we've been, you know, sheltered at home uh, for the past few months and that, uh, except for coming in the office occasionally, I've been watching, re-watching The Sopranos. And after every episode, I have to have a, a cigar. So that's that's the the quarantine custom for me. So I think everybody who's been watching the I think everybody who's been watching the Last Dance right now was like, well, oh, yeah, I'm going to start smoking too. cigars so I can go win. I mean, I haven't been able to watch. I haven't watched all the episodes, but I have watched a few, and it's it's incredible. I mean, it's amazing to see how Michael Jordan was just you know he was just in a different he was a different league. I mean, there's no question about it. He obviously loved to, he enjoys cigars, and that's a great thing. Yeah, there was a, a great clip I just saw of him where he's he and Tom Brady were playing in a celebrity golf tournament, and he's there putting with the cigar in his mouth the whole time as he's ready to putt, and, and he gets going. And uh, yeah, and I, and uh, you know Cam Newton, he's not afraid to he's not afraid to show that either. You know, yeah. nowadays, you know, with the political correctness and all that stuff, I mean, he just kind of does it because he enjoys it. Yeah, yeah. I was talking to um, somebody, and they were talking about how you know you smoke cigars before games, and and I said I, that's I heard that's why Cam Newton started smoking cigars is because he looked at the ultimate symbol of success was Michael Jordan, and Michael Jordan with the cigars and, and enjoying that, then Cam Newton started smoking. Um, I think Craig Cass can probably uh, validate that because I think Craig Cass has probably sold cigars to both of those guys, and but uh, but that's why I heard that Cam Newton started smoking cigars in the first place was because of Michael Jordan and looking up to him. So that's not a bad, it's not a bad way to go, in my opinion, either. Absolutely not. Yeah. Well, that's the the whole concept of the victory cigar. I, I don't I don't know too many people after a loss that they light up a cigar. You kind of have to win in order to have the, uh, the victory mm -hmm. cigar. So. Yeah, winning a national championship from LSU, for example, sitting yeah. on the couch enjoying the cigar. <laughs> for me, that was a quintessential shot of what exemplifies the cigar industry was Joe Burrow smoking a cigar after winning the championship for LSU. That was fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. I don't know if you guys saw it. The Bengals, where, where Burroughs was drafted, they announced their schedule on cigar bands. So, like, they had the different teams on there because of that because moment. That's awesome. Of, of really? Burroughs. So, you have to go and watch their intro video because I'm, I'm not a Bengals fan, but I'm going to be rooting for them this year because of that. <laughs> because of that. <laughs> yeah. I'm a Dolphins fan, so I'm, I'm rooting for the Dolphins. We need, to, we need to see if we can turn it around down here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Stay in the AFC. You guys can have all the success you want because uh, uh, I'm from the West, and so I've, I've been a Seahawks fan my entire life. So, um, But, yeah, you know, growing up with Dan Marino and watching him sling the ball and everything else, too, it would be great to see Miami 
um, you know, now that you don't necessarily have to worry about Tom Brady in your division, maybe maybe it will change around a little bit for you. Yeah, well, unfortunately, he didn't leave 10 years ago. He <laughs> 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 you know, waited too long. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I did, um, one of the, the questions, that, um, so I just want to uh, address a rumor right now. I have heard that you only write in red ink. Is that true? No, um, the person that always does that, his name is Craig Cass. <laughs> he's, he's one of those guys that always hangs around with a red pen because he's very meticulous about his note taking. <laughs> so I've tried to emulate him in many ways. And yes, sometimes I do use a red pen. But <laughs> Craig, he's the one that taught me that. Yeah. <laughs> hey, George, before we go to the next question, we got a shout out. We have a lot of different viewers from Hawaii, Australia, Nicaragua. Winter Park, Florida, New York City. Uh, a lot of people tuning in for this special uh, segment. Um, I want to kind of get past the, everything that's going on with uh, COVID-19 right now. You know, before all of this transpired and things kind of shifted, um, you, you know, are obviously very active with PCA on our advisory board, also Cigar Rights of America, and um, have been really fighting the fight on the legislative and, and regulatory side of, of things. Um, how can you know your average consumer that's tuning in today get involved and support the industry in the battles that we are, are fighting right now? Well, I mean, as, as you mentioned, I mean, this has been an ongoing battle for many years. Um, we've been able to unify some of us in the industry that Got together and formed the CRA many years ago, and uh, we've been able to accomplish many, you know, great things as an organization. Uh, one of the things that we've always tried to do is to try to, you know, get the consumer to be more involved in this process of, you know, speaking their mind, of explaining or trying to communicate to their, to their local, you know, to their politicians and their representatives, you know, what it means, you know, what this product means to them. And what this industry is really about. I mean, this industry, in, in many ways, is not characterized the right way. Um, in some cases, people are completely confused. They don't understand the type of products that we produce. They don't understand how they're produced. They don't understand how they're sold. Um, who buys them? I think that's been uh, that's been very detrimental to us in our industry because, in, in many ways, it's sort of uh, it doesn't give you the true picture of what our products are and who and who they're meant to be, who, who they're sold to. Um, you know, I would say to the people out there to speak their mind, you know, to write to their, to their local, you know, to their politicians and explain to them that they support this industry and that it's an important industry for them to have. I mean, this is an industry that's dominated by families, basically. I mean, at every level. You have families at every level in this industry, small businesses. That's what drives this industry. And, uh, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that, you know, we are facing this, you know, this regulation that, that will completely decimate the industry. It will completely eliminate everything that this industry stands for, the yeah. tradition, you know, the uniqueness of the industry, the essence of the industry, which is the family, unit, the family, the way that, you know, I know, I pretty much know most of my customers, most of my retail customers, I know them, I know I've been friends with them for years, I know their families, I know who, you know, I, when we do an event, I run into consumers that I've met over the years and, and we become friends, so I mean, this is a very unique industry, it's unlike other industries, so, you know, we've, that's been our message to, to get people to, to be more active, to be more involved in that process of communicating. Uh, you know, on our end, directly with in, in, in the political world, we've obviously also done a lot of work directly with them, with people in, in Capitol Hill, you know, in, in Washington, explaining what this industry is, explaining what we do, explaining what our families are all about, the hardships that we've gone through, um, you know, and that's sort of like the message that we've always tried to convey. Um, you know, we're not the bad guys here. We, we have products that are consumed by adults, sold through specialty re, um, retail stores, um, and it's a product that's not a product that is consumed at the same level as other tobacco products. So, I mean, that's kind of the message, right? How, you know, what, it, what, it, what it means to, to have these, these products that are artisanal in nature, handcrafted, 
uh, you know, not, not, you know, not, not in, a, in a great volume. Um, and it's very unique. I mean, I tell my friends all the time, my close friends, now I'm very fortunate to be a part of this industry. And I think, and I have great friends and some colleagues, uh, you know, that, that also manufacture cigars that, you know, we're basically of the same mindset in terms of how we view this industry. We all respect it tremendously and we all respect, you know, what, you know, the tradition that we, that, that, that has gotten us to where we are today. And it's a total, I mean, it would be a disaster to, to lose that, you know, to lose that, that tradition. Something that's been around for over a hundred years, um, or more than a hundred years, you know? Yeah. yeah. And that's, and that's kind of the message, right? How do we protect this industry? We're, tr we're doing everything possible on our end as manufacturers to spread that message to as many people as possible. But we need the support of the consumer in numbers so that they get out and they also express to the, important, you know, to the people that are in decision-making decision positions what this industry means to them. Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah, and, and that's, um, again, important to be involved in Cigar Rights of America. And someone was asking about that there. And, you know, you one of the I think, founding members and been a big supporter of Cigar Rights of America. We work hand in hand with them consistently. We're on weekly conference calls asking uh, how we can work better, more effectively, you know, consistently reaching out to Capitol Hill elected officials, administration officials. The other part, too, is, uh, you know, somebody from you know Colorado Premium Cigar and Pipe Association, out there, we have state associations, we have retailers and different coalitions throughout the states as well. Um, one of the things that we found that's most impactful is having our consumers being involved with the local retailers, particularly the local level. So often we see that at the local level, whether it's new taxes that come along or whether it's smoking bans or consistently trying to chip away at the, the cigar consumers' rights or the retailers at their businesses, the best way is a, is a really strong a bonded coalition from the consumer and the retailer at that local level because it stops uh, onerous and dangerous legislation and regulation in its tracks at the local level before it ever has a chance to percolate up to the national and federal level. And so I would just say to any anyone that's out there, support your local retailer, and even just when you're buying cigars, hey, how can I get involved? How can I help you? Um, and that's very beneficial because it starts to amplify our voice in a way that we can't do just on our own. Because if I'm elected official in a certain district and I've got five, six, 10 store owners, that's a powerful voice. But when I start lumping in 50, 100 consumers who are all influential, they all vote, they have friends and family members that they can influence as well, that then becomes somebody that I must listen to and I must consider when I am trying to determine public policy. And that's why it's so important that consumers are involved, especially at the local level. You, you can't take anything for granted right now. I mean, no, exactly. From, 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 because of all the situations that we're facing as an industry, as a nation, there's a lot of moving parts right now. Uh, obviously, the, the situation that we're facing as a nation and, uh, and because of this virus is one thing that obviously complicates the matter that much more. But if you look at it more in the terms of the regulate, regulatory and the tobacco world, I think it's important that everyone be more active, not just the consumer, but also the retailers. You know, there's a lot of retailers out there that might not be doing as much as they should, you know, to, to get the word out, to talk to their consumers that are coming in on a daily basis. So I think it's it's sort of like a, you have to look at it more as a, a combined effort from both the consumer, the retailers, and the manufacturers, where, you know, we're pushing that message so that people are more involved, you know. Absolutely. And I think, you know, this this week with uh, the executive order that was announced on Tuesday about deregulation to open up the economy and get people back, you know, in, in the retail sector, saving these small businesses, we all can do our part and support the local brick and mortar retailers uh, in that sense. And then on the political side and the advocacy side, you know, remain active. I, I, I you know, definitely concur with both of you. I think looking into 2021, we're going to be facing challenges on the tax front like we, we haven't seen in, in recent years, you know, whether it's local state governments trying to fill their coffers after, after not having a, a good year in terms of tax revenue and having to spend a lot on government programs, they're going to look to things like premium cigars to tax so we're going to need to be very active 
um, and, you know, go on the offense and, and talk about that and those personal stories about why this is important and why you shouldn't have to pay, you know, $150 a cigar, that that's not feasible. We're a unique product that is vastly different than, um, you know, the mass market, as, as you correctly pointed out. And because what they'll do is they'll tack businesses out of existence and then, then all of that revenue is gone. Well, the thing is, like, the... This, my dad, my dad, our business is, he was basically like the American dream. Right? He, he's someone that came here with nothing and we built this business. And um, if, if we would have had these challenges that we have today, these would have been around 25 years ago, we wouldn't be where we are today. You know, my dad, is a, we're a perfect example of that. And that's, I think, a big part of the reason why I fight as hard as I do, because I think it's important that everyone get an opportunity to, to, to fulfill the, the dream that they have. I mean, we have a lot of manufacturers that have come in to this industry in the last 10 years that, you know, I don't want those. I mean, I really honestly do not want that to happen. I don't want those manufacturers that are new manufacturers to have to go out of the industry. I think it's good to have competition. You know, I don't think that's a bad thing. And, you know, I think that the ones that are hurt the most are the smaller man, the small companies. You know, those are the ones that suffer the most with all of these uh, you know, regulations that are coming in and with all these uh, challenges that we're facing from every, from every level. Yeah. Yeah. There, there, there's no question. And then that's, it's that one of the unintended consequences of, of them trying to make a policy and it impacting an industry that by their own admission is a low, it's a low priority for them. And that's one of the things that we've often talked about is we're so different that we cannot be lumped in. And that's why we've been so aggressive on our education for policymakers. And hopefully we have a lot of them listening and watching this to understand the very big difference between premium cigars. But just the mere fact that you mentioned here, and I don't think that this can be overlooked about how important it, that the statement is and what it means to the industry. But you talked about how meticulous you are. The tobacco has to age. And if it's not ready, we're not going to produce the cigars. And I'd rather have less. That is not that is not that consistent with other mass produced products that they are seeking to regulate or things that are now new in ways of delivering nicotine to the system that they are seeking to regulate. And that, and what's really interesting, and here's another reason why I think it's important for consumers to grow their voice as well, is that we've noticed that when we've been working with administration officials, they said it's really interesting because they have now shifted, they meaning mostly the FDA, where they've been concerned about usage statistics and patterns for cigarettes and vaping and electronic nicotine delivery systems, devices, to where with cigars, we've proven that the usage is not, it's not anything that they should be concerned about because we know they can, you know, 30 years old is when you start smoking generally, average usage 1.2 days out of 30. So the usage isn't there to, to qualify or justify what they're doing. So now they've switched to, well, let's focus on the product in and of itself. And that, the, the case continues to fall apart. And so that's why for us, why we say, Consumers being involved add strength to the voice of what we have been saying all along about how the product is not only made, but how the product is enjoyed. Everything from seed all the way through to ash demonstrates why this is being treated unfairly and needs to have those regulations go away as it pertains to this industry. I mean, you can't, you can't, um, you can't forget what percentage of the tobacco industry are premium cigars. Yeah. One percent, I think, a point oh oh one percent or point oh two percent. I don't even know exactly what the percentage is, but I know it's point zero one one. Exactly. So I mean, you know, I think that that's you know, I'm not, I've never advocated against any tobacco product. I only look at our products and the ones that are similar to ours. And when I when I talk about these issues, I'm referring to our products and why our products should not be regulated where they should uh, be considered a different type of product than the ones that we're together with. Because, you know, we're not trying to establish what's a good or what's, what's good or bad. Or we're only trying to establish that there's a difference. Exactly. And there's a big difference in how the cigars are made, how they're sold, and who buys them. And that's, you cannot under, you know, you can't express that enough. Mm -hmm. That we're just not the same. We're a different product. We shouldn't be categorized in the same breath as some as other tobacco products. We've got just about five or so minutes left with our hour here. 
Uh, a couple of questions that I think we like to ask a lot. Um, one, one that I really love asking is, you know, you oftentimes will have a lot of different product lines and some are very popular, some get really popular and then they kind of tail off. But I just want to know if there's any kind of particular cigar that you really enjoy that maybe isn't quite as popular as some of the other ones or that maybe was popular for a little while and now they don't, it's not necessarily as smoked as much as, as usual or as some of the other products that are out there. Is there any particular cigar that you thoroughly enjoy or that you maybe check with the others? What's that? I smoke any Padron. <laughs> <laughs> like, and like I said, well, I kind of figured that. I mean, <laughs> we, we make cigars for us to smoke and the ones we can't smoke, we sell. That's, <laughs> my father said that to me a long time ago and I actually thought it was a great thing because that's really how we look at this. George, you know, that's what? kind of a loaded answer. You, you were <laughs> giving me the business earlier in the, the interview that I gave you a loaded qu question. That was a loaded answer. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should be a lobbyist. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, listen, you know, it, it goes back to the mentality, right? When all of our products stay Padron, I mean, period. There's no, that's what we're selling. We're selling our name. We're selling what we stand for. And, you know, having said that, every product we make is worthy of having our name on it, in our opinion. So that's the bottom line. You know, we don't want to put a product out there that's a shitty product. And, you know, listen, it's a handmade product. Things can happen. It's not, a, I mean, as much as we try to be as perfect as possible, it could happen. You can have a cigar that doesn't, it's not what you expect it to be. And I, rem and I, and I, I'll never forget it, man. We used to talk about it with my dad all the time. We, my dad always used to tell people, if there's ever a problem with any of our cigars, we want to know about it. We're not, you know, don't be afraid to tell us if you feel there's a problem with the product that you purchased under with a Padron name on it. We stand behind the product because, you know, for every one customer that might tell you there's a problem, there could be 10 that don't. So, I mean, not to sound negative or, you know, about it, but, the, the fact of the matter is, is that it is a handmade product and there could be, you know, issues that come up in production. You know, as much as you try to be perfect and try to control everything as much as possible, sometimes it's just not possible. And that's, you know, the last thing in the world we want is for that product to end up in somebody's hand, pay for the cigar, and then they have a bad experience with it. I mean, that's not, that's not, you know, obviously that's not the goal. So before we ask the last question here, I just want to ask this one. Shorty wants to know where his missing cigar is. <laughs> Shorty. Shorty's the character. I think he, he set that up. Yes. He sends me a picture of a box that's full and one cigar on the bottom is missing cellophane and missing a band. <laughs> it's just a random inside the box. I think he set me up. To it. <laughs> so I wouldn't doubt it. What are you uh, enjoying today, George? Uh, this is a uh, Family Reserve 85, natural. And so, and what, uh, anything that uh, you would like to let retailers and consumers know in terms of anything as far as uh, special releases you have coming out this year, uh, obviously the, the news of the cancellation of the trade show. So any releases around that time that you're planning for some other time during this year or anything else to look forward to in 2020? I mean, new releases have never been the driving force behind our company. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've historically come out with products to celebrate special moments in the company's history or, you know, in, in many cases to celebrate my dad's, um, you know, birthdays and things of that nature. Um, but we're not a company that really is very, uh, I would say, I don't even know how to say it, but creative in the sense of all these new products. Um, we kind of stick to the basics, stick to the, the, the main lines that have been the, the heart and soul of the company. Um, you know, we really haven't uh, introduced a lot of new products over the years, and uh, I mean, I don't, I don't foresee that changing much um, coming up. I mean, obviously, whenever we can, if possible, we would, we would never hesitate to come out with a new product if we feel that it could be, you know, if it could add value to the brand and also, um, you know, maintain the, the levels of uh, quality that we expect and that customers expect of our products. So you never say never, and you, you know, obviously you're always looking to do it, but it's not that's not top of mind uh, in order to generate business. Yeah. For me, what generates business is to have a quality product. And yeah. 
the more things you, you try to invent and the more things you try to do, the less you can focus on the essence of what your business is. And I know what the essence of my business is. So I don't I don't want to reinvent the wheel here. You know, yeah. Keep it stupid. Make good products, focus on the quality, don't go crazy, and, and keep it going. Can you do anything fun to celebrate the 50th anniversary? Pardon me? Anything fun to celebrate the 50th anniversary? Well, we're celebrating 56 years 50, this year. Okay. 50 years in Nicaragua. Oh, okay, okay. Rocky was founded in 1907, the factory. But the company was founded in 1964. Yeah, that's what, uh, oh, we got the 26, but yeah, so the 64. Yeah, so but, this, yeah. year, this year is our 56th anniversary. Gotcha. And, um, and I don't know, we'll see. I mean, the really nothing in, in, in store right now. As far as, uh, as far as that's concerned, I got four more years till you, you hit the next milestone, then, right? So you hit well, that'll come soon. That'll come in a couple of years. Yeah. So right. hopefully by then we'll have you know more family members involved in the company, and, and you know we'll it'll be a different dynamic in the industry and also you know in the in the, in the world around us too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, maybe maybe by that point we'll be able to see each other face to face again. Absolutely, I'd love that. I was just going to say, George, we can't wait till you are back in D.C. and visiting uh, the townhouse here. I enjoyed the time spent with you, and uh, we really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to do this interview with us and all of your you know, support that you do in the, the industry. Thank you very much, and um, I often, obviously I appreciate you guys very much. I appreciate the PCA and what uh, the organization stands for, um, you know, for me, the, the retailers that I've become very close friends with and many others that we've met over the years are the backbone of this industry and uh, obviously a very important part of what we do as a company and, and, and how we feel about the industry in general. So, you know, nothing, you know, for me, what I always hope for is to have the strongest uh, brick and mortar um, group as possible. Um, you know, while at the same time, obviously the business evolves, and you know you have different um, different types of distribution channels that develop over the years. But we can't uh, ever forget about the importance of the, that face-to-face -face transaction, and you know what that represents uh, for companies like ours. That um, you know that many many years ago um, benefited from that uh, you know, from that, and all the people that have supported our products over the years. Outstanding. Well, thank you very much for your time today, uh, George. It's been great seeing you and talking to you again. Um, Before we leave, I'm trying to get some family members to come on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Bring them all in. See how many we can uh, get on the screen here. They're coming now, so uh, <laughs> we can meet uh, some of the people here. Morning. Yeah, come here. How are you? My brother Orlando. How are you? Orlando. How are you doing? Good, and yourself? My nephew, Andres. Oh, hey, Andres, how are you? Look at this. My nephew, AJ. Hello. My niece, Kimberly. Hi. Hello, oh, Kimberly. My other nephew, Hello. Jeffrey. Hey, hey. 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 Marcos. Watch those rings. So this is only part. This is this is what, what we did here is that we formed the uh, Padron COVID uh, task force. <laughs> <laughs> it's the family. So yeah. Uh, Last seven weeks, it's basically been. Uh, this is my sister Lisette. Um, and how are you? Get get Jorge Luis and and, uh, and Marcos. We we'll finish uh, out. Tell them to come so they can, so they can introduce themselves. Yeah. Uh, basically, all the work that's been done in the last uh, six seven weeks has been done by this group that you see here. Uh, that's amazing. Basically, you know, doing all the receiving shipments, packaging orders, picking orders. Uh, you know. Planning with Nicaragua, so you know I think my dad would have been very proud to have had uh, the family here working, you know, at all hours of the day trying to get stuff done. Yeah, you know I, I don't want to speak for all retailers out there, but I can tell you this: when whenever I go into a retail store, I love to talk to them about the products they move and the, uh, consistently. Hey, what, what do you guys like to sell a lot of it? I mean, Padron is almost consistently the first thing that comes out of their mouth about what they sell a lot of. So I think on behalf of all retailers, I want to say thank you very much for continuing your production out there because I know that it's a very important product for all of our retailers out there that you guys are continuing to work the way you are. And this is this is my son, Jorge Luis. Hello, he's here. Hello, how are you doing? Good to see you. 
one, my nephew Marcos, I don't know where he is. I think he's likely doing a package that's going out for a retailer. So <laughs> we'll, we'll let him stay working. Outstanding. That's great. It is amazing to see all of you. I hope you guys are all very uh, safe and, and healthy down there. Uh, best wishes to all of you. And again, thank you. I can't thank you enough for the Padron and Padron family support of the PCA and, and the retailers as a whole. Um, it means the world to the retailers. I can tell you that. And uh, hopefully soon we'll all get to see each other. And uh, for me, George, I can't wait to share another Cuban coffee with you because uh, one of the first times I ever had the Cuban coffee was down at your place there. And it was just really, I'm, I love coffee. It's one of my favorite drinks, and it was so ridiculously delicious. So I can't wait for that too. And, and it I'm, was, I'm, I'm looking forward to having a drink, man. So, yeah. so. Well, it, was, it was terrible the last time you we were at the PCA office. We didn't have any coffee, not even Cuban coffee. We ran we, out of coffee. We, we were completely. out, yeah, because we had just I had the event. I felt so, yeah. so bad. You were <laughs> tired. They, they, the Cuban, they, they, didn't, they, they forgot that the Cuban was coming in, that he needed his coffee. <laughs> Well, we had just had the event the night before, and so we were out of everything. Uh, All right. To make All right. Sure. All right. All right. Guys. Bye, 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 guys